Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Masters Week in New York. Is the market for historic works in decline? Plus, the controversial Hindu temple built on the site of a destroyed mosque in Ayodhya, India, and a lithograph by Honoré Daumier. Scott Rayburn, a market reporter for the art newspaper, has for some time been exploring the decline in the trade for old master paintings. He joins me to look ahead to the auctions in Masters Week in New York, which begin this weekend. In India, on Monday, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated a vast temple to the Hindu god Ram in the city of Ayodhya. The temple replaces a 16th century mosque that was destroyed by Hindu mobs in 1992, an event that provoked riots in which nearly 2,000 people died, most of them Muslims. Our deputy Deputy Art Market Editor and regular correspondent in India, Kabir Jalla, is in Mumbai and joins us to discuss this pivotal issue in modern Indian history, what it means ahead of India's general election in the spring and whether it's affecting the country's art market. And this episode's work of the week is Madame Deménage, a political cartoon from 1867 by the French artist Honoré Daumier that was deemed so provocative in its time that it was not published. A lithograph, it's part of an exhibition at the Stadel Museum in Frankfurt that features 120 Daumier works from the Helwig collection. Hans-Jürgen Helwig, the man behind that collection, joins me to discuss this incendiary image. Don't forget that you can still buy the Art Newspapers magazine The Year Ahead 2024, an authoritative guide to the world's must-see art exhibitions and museum openings, many of which were discussed on our podcast from the 12th of January. Get a print and digital subscription to the Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com before the 15th of February to receive a copy of The Year Ahead with your next printed issue, or you can buy the magazine on its own on the website for just £9.99 or $13.69. Do also subscribe to this podcast and to our sister podcast A Brush With, which Turns next week wherever you're listening. Please also leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, from tomorrow, Masters Week begins in the New York auction houses, one of the key moments in the calendar for the sale of historic painting, sculpture and prints. The sales come hot on the heels of the December Old Master sales in London that were generally agreed to be subdued, with a small and early rediscovered Rembrandt at Sotheby's failing to ignite a bidding war and selling to its third-party guarantor for £11 million with fees, and two highly regarded Canaletto paintings of Venice in superb condition selling for £9.7 million with fees, well within its estimate at Christie's. So if even Rembrandt and Canaletto are not prompting much excitement, what hope is there for the wider market? Can the auction houses find surprising gems and promote less well-known artists like the Flemish painter Michael Sviertz, who's suddenly in much demand, to greater heights? To make matters worse, what was expected to be the top loss of this Masters Week, a much-hyped portrait of Isabel de Bourbon, Queen of Spain, from 1632 by Diego Velázquez, with an estimate in the region of $35 million, was withdrawn from Sotheby's sale earlier this month, apparently apparently because of ongoing discussions between its owners. Our correspondent Scott Rayburn has long attempted to fathom the decline of the master's market and whether there are any rays of hope, and I spoke to him ahead of the coming auctions. The estimates for works that we quote in the discussion are, of course, in US dollars. Scott, what do you think the mood is at the auction houses ahead of this master's week? Uh, Well, I'm not in New York and I'm not working for an auction house (laughs) and they wouldn't tell me anyway. But um, reading between the lines, I suppose the main news is that the top lot of the week, the Velasquez, estimated at 35 million, has been withdrawn. And now this is a a massive blow because in the old master's market, these trophy lots make an enormous difference to the figures. Uh, Sotheby's revised estimate for the auction is $23 million dollars. Now, had the Velasquez been in there, of course, we'd be up to 58. And significantly, back in January last year, Sotheby's sale uh, made over 70 million. And that was thanks to a a Rubens that made 25 million. Now, that Rubens at 25 million is equivalent to the entire value of Sotheby's sale now. Right. So it shows the importance of so-called trophy lots. Well, let's talk about the Velasquez then. So basically, this is one of those lots. There's there's a really interesting quote in a piece that you wrote by Todd Levin, who's a, a dealer. And he said that, that basically there are probably no more than 200 works of art in private hands that can come to market. Yeah. Does that get to the nub of the, of the problem in I terms th- of I, th- I, I, I think it crystallises it very well. Now, it could be 300, it could be 150. But he's one of the few people who actually knows about the contemporary market, works in the contemporary market, knows about old masters and buys old masters with clients. And they're they're, they're very unusual, these people. So it's a good talking point, that number. 
But, well, let's think about this Velasquez. Would it be among them? Would you pay £35 million for this painting? Well, I'm a massive Velasquez fan. <laughs> well, so how, I'm, I'm good, like, how good a Velasquez do you think this is? Well, it's a really interesting one because it's sort of early-ish Velasquez. He's not quite into his stride, but he's just about getting there. Okay. He's met Rubens. He's back sure. from his first Italy trip. He's getting into his stride. Sure. I mean, I, I was looking at it and I was thinking, wouldn't it look nice on the walls of the National Gallery next to their great picture of Philippe the Fourth in brown and silver? Sure. But yes, is it an absolute master? A piece, it's, it, I guess it, that's the question. Well, compare right? it to something like a great early work, the, the Water Cellar in Apsley House. Now, that's an exciting, astounding mm. painting. To me, now this is only a personal view, uh, this princess looks like a Dalek. There's <laughs> just so little movement, there's so little excitement. You look at the hands, are the hands that exciting? Are the hands that good? The facial expression, he and his studio have to make some kind of effort with the face. But 35 million? Is it something you want to go into in a room every morning and admire and be thrilled by? I'm not so sure. Right, I'm that's not really so sure. But maybe it isn't in the 200. I don't. But, but it's all subjective. Of course, the key thing when a work by an artist like Velasquez comes up is that part of the marketing has to be, this is the most important painting sure. to come onto the market since Juan de Pereja. Yeah. That's, that's the key thing. So the marketing yeah. drive was in gear. I've looked up the cuttings. You know, there was a hell of a lot of press around such an important Velasquez coming to the market. So you can see how much of a blow it would be to Sotheby's, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. And, of course, the press are a part of the problem as well because they only think about brand names. So, that oh, it's a Velasquez, so then you get to write about it. And that confuses the situation as well to a certain extent, but creates the hype. Absolutely. One of the interesting things that you've been looking at recently is the extent to which the pool of those brand names may be getting smaller. Yeah. And I'm interested in whether the market itself is dictating that or are they responding to a wider public interest in artists? Who's telling us that this pool of artists is getting smaller? Well, I, I think this is the, the most fascinating question at the centre of not just the whole old master market, but old master culture and how it fits into the way we live now and, and approach artistic life and, and cultural matters. It's actually quite fun to focus the mind by thinking, well, what are the must-have trophy names, the household names that someone who's just sold a tech company or a, a string of restaurants or a car factory in China, the name that everyone knows that they have serious bragging rights for? Because it's all about showing off. You know, they show some friends into that. Look what I've got. Here is an incredible name that will make anyone envious. But how many of these old dead white men are there that can give you these bragging rights in the way that you can say, my son is just going to Harvard? You know, it's an interesting question. Now, I, I'm down to seven and a half. I don't know about you, Ben. OK, give us your uh, I'll give, give you seven my and seven and a half. So we start with Leonardo, Michelangelo, Botticelli, Caravaggio, Vermeer, Velasquez, Goya, and here comes the half, late Turner, because no one cares about the early stuff. OK. That's interesting. So let's sort of kick that around. What about you? What about what are the glaring omissions that uh, a billionaire would have to have? Well, this is the thing is that I remember that the National Gallery recently bought a painting by Orazio Gentileschi for a decent sum. Mm. So that makes me wonder about to what extent are there names that are still big names, but within a kind of museum world and, in, you know, in, in, and those that are the big names. So, for instance, people have told me that they visited the Franz Hals exhibition at the National Gallery and they found it very surprisingly empty, you know, like stunningly quiet given what a master he is. That show I was bowled over by. I, I was stunned and amazed and thrilled by it. It seems that not so many people are excited by it. So there's a question about whether Hals is a great master. I don't know, you know, and I think this is the curious thing is because it seems it's so many artists are in play, as it were, in the way that they weren't before. N no, absolutely. I had a similar experience when I went to the Donatello exhibition, the V&A. Now, you know, people who know about sculpture would say Donatello is one of the two or three greatest sculptors who ever lived, possibly the greatest. But it was half empty. Now... How much of this is a, a symptom of the fact we actually live in quite a Philistine country? Um, we're not particularly well educated. And of course, we want to have less and less education about the arts because it's useless because we must learn our maths. <laughs> um, so it's, it's difficult to make generalisation about exhibitions in this country. But I think House is interesting. I think Rembrandt is even more of a talking point, actually, because he's traditionally regarded as a sort of a Shakespearean figure in, in Western art. Yet when his works come up in the market, they can often disappoint in terms of demand. Now, I haven't got Rembrandt on that list. I don't actually think 
that a very rich person who's coming new to the art world would feel that excited by owning a Rembrandt. Now, that's a very shocking thing to say yeah. if someone from the 19th century were listening to this podcast. They'd say, what the hell are you talking about? You know, Kenneth Clark would get a shotgun out and kill me for that. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is that his paintings are very brown. Attributionally, they're a nightmare, most of them. And his paintings of women, the women tend to look like Rembrandt. And there's very little decorative appeal to them. And, and I can understand why in our culture he has dropped off that must-have list. But in terms of art historical reputation, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like saying, why bother ever to listen to Bach again? It's crazy. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, yes, Rembrandt is one of my probably top five artists ever, I'd say. Another name I would say is on that list, hmm. Artemisia Gentileschi, because okay. it seems to me that her star has risen... And, you know, that show at the National Gallery really, really propelled if it. If you were lucky more. enough to get to it. Indeed, yes. Yeah, yeah. I wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there you go. But yeah, it seems to me that that brings up an interesting question, which, of course, is are the auction houses really in search of names that they can add to that list? Because we're talking about a list for collectors, aren't we? We're sure. not talking about a list for scholars and museums and so on. So it seems to me that Artemis is on it. But it does seem to me that, again, that the auction houses are in a real dilemma because they've got to find new work to bring to the market. But there's such a, a small pool for them to choose from. Utterly. There's a small pool of artists that are genuinely attractive to a wider audience. The majority of pictures that come up in old master sales are really pretty boring. There's no getting away. They're very unrelatable. Uh, they're dull religious subjects, dull genre subjects, dull decorative subjects. There's no getting away from that. So it's, it's a massive problem for the auction houses, how they're going to reinvent that. In addition, that their pool of buyers is pretty small. So when a work that is by a, a big name comes up, it's really important that they hype it to the heavens and get as high a price as possible because they are there to sell art. But Artemisia is a very good example now because she actually is sort of catnip in the market because if you go to TFAF Maastricht, the American Museum curators are just running around the aisles. Do you have any women artists? That is what they really, really want. And so with Artemisia... If you get hold of an Artemisia and it's confirmed and authenticated by the right scholars, you can sell it very, very easily. And she's a really good artist. I think that was a transformative thing, that show. Like Susanna and the Elders, which she painted yeah. when 16. How many 16-year-olds <laughs> have painted a picture that good? Yeah, she, she's an astonishing yeah. artist, yeah. Really interestingly, you get these auction sales that make you sit up and take notice still within the old master sales there was a sale in december which you wrote about as you said there was a small rembrandt which had only recently been attributed to him at that stage it's a, a small early one it is very dark and it was sort of very heavily promoted but got one bidder and that was the guarantor. There were then some canalettos, which the leading scholar in canaletto said were astonishing, extraordinary, the top of the top, and yet two bids. So that was surprising. And yet there was a Swiertz painting, an artist who by no means would get near that list that we would compile of the sort of great masters. And that did really well. So why did that do well? I don't, I don't really understand if the market is struggling, why a painting like that would go for so much. Well, I was mystified by the lack of demand for the Rembrandt and for the Canaletto. But then I spoke to people. Now, with the Rembrandt, it wasn't universally accepted by scholars that this is a Rembrandt. Now, this often happens when attribution upgrades happen. But I think doubts about the security of the attribution was an element there. Maybe not enough people believed in it. The Canaletto I found mystifying because that was the best of the best. The reason I was given for, for that pair of paintings that they didn't do well is they weren't big enough. Yeah. So uh, they didn't have wall power. They, <laughs> you've got to have wall power, which and, again, is, is the, that comes from the world of contemporary art. You go around freeze, you're surrounded by massive, colourful paintings, aren't you? And they're a lot bigger than those Canalettos. But Canaletto used to always finish major old master sales and do well until about 10, 15 years ago. And now he doesn't do so well. Is that the fact that very rich people don't go to Venice that much and they go to St. Bart's more or the Seychelles? That might be a factor. Maybe they're just, well, they are in a sense, with one or two exceptions, just picture postcards as well. You know, the Stone Mason's Yard, the National Gallery is the great exception, but they are picture postcards and they are 
to a certain degree, quite conventional. I know the, the detail is exquisite, but maybe to a contemporary sensibility, they're not quite exciting enough anymore. Right. And the spheres? Well, I remember going to Christie's and on my way to Christie's and people saying, have you seen the Swirts? Have you seen the Swirts? Now, to be perfectly honest, I'd hardly ever heard of Swirts and I write about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't. So I went along and just so many people were clustered around this painting. And the thing about it was it was an extraordinary composition for a start because, because you had this 17th century uh, Flemish artist in his Roman studio, which is an interesting situation in itself, with a model, very attractive, elaborately dressed model, uh, sewing, and then a young man admiring the model next to a pile of classical uh, sculptures and plasters. A tremendously evocative image of life in a studio in, in Rome during that period in the 17th century. And then in the distance, almost like in Las Meninas, there was a, a figure in a doorway. So there was lots going on. It had a tremendous atmosphere. The other thing was, very unusually, it had been completely untouched since the 17th century. Now, this is virtually unheard of in the old master trade, where pictures are restored and mucked around. And so people were looking at it with UV lights and various instruments and just admiring the utter, utter perfection of it. And Christie's, very sensibly, didn't touch it either. The fun story about it also is that apparently it was in a, in a house in France and the person who owned the picture was approached by a, a dealer, someone who in England would be called a knocker, basically, and had heard about the picture and he said, well, I'll, I'll give you 10 grand for this painting. And then a week later, he came back and said, well, actually, actually, I'll give you 100 grand for this painting. <laughs> At which point the owner started to get a bit suspicious and the reason that happened is because in France, if you discovered that you've made a huge markup on an antique or a work of art, that, that is actually illegal in France. But fascinatingly, the owner's son plays squash and he went for a game of squash and he started to talk about this painting with a guy he was playing with and his squash partner worked for Christie's. <laughs> So that's how it ended up in Christmas. word. What a story. Okay. Um, <laughs> so that's an example of a, of a work that surprises us. Absolutely. And that's what this market needs. It needs surprises Absolutely. all the time it's, and it Absolutely. finds them really hard. You've seen the lot lists for the, for the yeah. auctions coming up in New York. Any surprises? Anything that might grab our attention? Well, the, the first thing to say is that the estimates are very similar. It's 23 million at Sotheby's and 24 million at Christie's which is relatively low. The problem is supply, getting exciting pictures, getting big name pictures. The loss of the Velasquez is, is, is really important because, of course, that takes a sort of headline newsmaking lot out of the series. There are interesting paintings there, but they're lower down the price range. And, of course, the media doesn't really get very excited about it. But there is an Artemisia at Christie's. Now, I, I looked at this, I looked at the cataloguing, and often auction houses can be uh, a little bit too quick on the trigger with reattributions and upgrades, but this has been authenticated, or ratified rather, by three leading Artemisia experts. It's uh, St. John in the Wilderness. It was a sleeper in a sale in Italy where it was uh, catalogued as Neapolitan school, and it seems to be A-OK. -okay. And it's uh, estimated $400,000, which doesn't seem to me excessive. Hmm. And so that should do well. But it's a relatively low price for her it paintings is. in it, recent ab years. Ab right? Absolutely, absolutely. So that, hopefully, for the sake of the market and the mood, that should fly. There's also, again, at Christie's, there's another interesting painting by a woman artist, a French artist called Anne Valéria Costa, who, again, I, I didn't really know much about, it's actually a very beautiful still life of musical instruments on a ledge. This is a late 18th century painting. She's described by Christie's as the second most important still life painter in France after Chardin. I don't know, that might be hyping her talent a little bit, but it's an exquisite painting. And interestingly, in the last couple of years, two of her paintings have made over a million. Now, this is estimated at $500,000. It's a very decorative image, and it's by a very good woman artist. So again, that should do well. But as I said, there is a mass of paintings at both houses estimated between 50,000 and 500,000. A lot of it is really, really dull. 
um, <laughs> uh, with a few interesting smaller works. But you have to know a little bit about the old master market to sort of get excited about. At Christie's, there's a, a really beautiful Vittori Carpaccio fragment from a larger altarpiece, a head of a donor of a man, and there's a, a rather marvellous dog in the background. Now, Carpaccio is one of the great names of, of, of Venetian art, and as is pointed out in the catalogue, he was also an extremely good portrait painter. So even though it's a fragment, it's a really exquisite head of a Renaissance man, and that's $300,000, that's the low estimate. And we always have to put it in perspective, you know, we talk about 200, 300, people are paying that amount of money for a small Flora Yutnovich. You know, you, you always go back to the contemporary to get things into perspective. Well, I, I always think that and often looking through the catalogues and even though you say, you know, they're not stellar pictures, sure. but they're certainly a lot better than a lot of the contemporary painting that's going on there. <laughs> what, we, what I hadn't said is, goes, well, it's the same for all periods of art. Most of it is really boring and repetitive and derivative. And it's the same in the old master market and it's the same in the contemporary market. Most of it isn't that great. So tell us at Sotheby's. what, what do you uh, think? Sotheby's. Well, there's an interesting Salmon Van Rysdale of an estuary with shipping. Now, this is estimated at 2 to $3 million, and it's pretty indicative of the state of the old master market uh, generally. Because back in 1995, it was in the British Rail Pension Fund sale. Now, that was the only moment when a major financial institution has taken a big bet on art as an alternative investment. And it just about made a small profit, thanks to, a, among a series of sales, the one huge success was an Impressionist sale in the late 80s, which made a huge amount of money, and that made a profit for the fund. Uh, the old master results were a little bit patchier, but this uh, Van Rysdale, fascinatingly, in 1995, made $1.4 million, which, even in today's money, seems a huge, huge sum. It was then handled twice by uh, Robert Nortman, the famous Maastricht dealer, the man who actually, in a sense, created the TFAF Maastricht Fair to get loads and loads of rich collectors to come to his gallery, basically. <laughs> now, I don't think he would have sold that a loss. So maybe he's, he sold it for, in dollars, I don't know, two and a half, three million dollars. The estimate's pretty interesting and very indicative of what's happened to the old mastermind. And also very indicative of what's happened to demand for Dutch 17th century pictures at the TFAF Fair that level of demand has really, really diminished because tastes have changed. And also, and this is a sort of global problem, of course, the, the middle classes in every developed country have become a squeeze. So doctors and dentists and lawyers haven't got the disposable income to buy pictures. Uh, they're, they're spending money on their kids' university fees and so on. Right. So that's a problem. So that tells the story. Right. And um, th there are other sort of major names, but they're, again, sort of relatively modest pictures, aren't they? Sure. I mean, I noticed that there's a Rubens self-portrait, which, again, it's like, you know, sort of beginning of he's come back from Italy. He's sure, beginning sure. to become Rubens, the Rubens. But it's still a, it's a self-portrait. It's perfectly okay. okay. It's nothing special. But that, again, is a sort of... That's again, we're in the realm five, of attributional it? upgrades, and this is a, a real minefield. And I, I was speaking to some dealers about this, and, and the overall levels of scholarship for artists like Rubens and Van Dyck, I gather, are slightly problematic at the moment. Right. There is no great specialist who's absolutely revered as the expert on these artists. So you get reattributions, and then you get endless tittle-tattle in the trades. Oh, no, that's not Van Dyck, that's not Rubens. So that's a, a bubbling away sort of continuous problem with these upgrades. I see. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Um, Hence the relatively low estimate of three million on the Rubens and no one's guaranteed it. At Sotheby's, there's an absolutely beautiful Joshua Reynolds, which was on show in London in December. Now, this has been deaccessioned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I think it's quite easy to infer from these deaccessions that, oh my God, these major museums just want to unload old masters and buy Flora Univishes. But speaking to, to people in the trade who have been around, say it's been going on for a long, long time. And American museums are required to sell at auction if they take session for transparency purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, but this painting is of Nancy Horton, 
who is described as a political courtesan, one of a sort of interesting group of human beings in 18th century <laughs> London. And Reynolds did some great portraits and mediocre portraits and all right portraits, but I think this is a really tremendous painting. And in a good condition. It good looks condition. in wonderful condition, and she's in a sort of exotic costume, and that looks a beautiful painting to buy and live with. Right. And that's a real highlight. When I saw the price for that, you know, that's one of those things that Reynolds in the UK, I realise that beyond the UK, he is not a, sure. a stellar a name as, as he is here but seeing that price for Reynolds which is what did you say it's uh, six hundred thousand dollars now he's a big big figure that seems fair to me and he's an incredibly as I'm sure you've noticed incredibly uneven artist isn't he can be absolutely terrible but this is a really gorgeous painting so um, I'd take that home any day I was wondering if the sort of most telling thing that we can deduce from the way that the sales are being marketed is that the highest price lot in the whole of Masters Week is in the one sale, which is at Sotheby's and which has a whole range of different things, decorative objects and so on. And it's six pairs of Michael Jordan sneakers. And isn't this telling us actually where the auction houses are most interested in some ways at the moment? No, utterly, because in December, when I went to the, the old Master Views at Christie's, what was being flagged up was luxury everywhere. It's difficult to evaluate this because luxury is incredibly important to the auction houses to bring new clients in. Because in most cases with luxury, in relative terms, the price point is relatively low. Okay, it's $200,000 for a Hermes handbag, which to anyone, normal person living a normal life is absolutely ridiculous. But in the auction world, that's a small amount of money. But it does bring in new clients and it's massively important for the auction houses. And the actual number, as I checked with Christie's at their end of year conference, the actual percentage of sales in terms of money that luxury generates is fairly sort of steady and static. It's not overtaking the whole shebang. It's about the Christie's, I think it was about 14% last year. But it's fascinating when you go to the website, the first thing you're hit with hard is luxury. You have to press a button or two to go through it all masters, which, is, of course, is inconceivable back in the day. Exactly. And so lastly, I guess it's, it's interesting what you say about luxury being the kind of entry point for new collectors. Do you think they would be attempting to steer people towards the old masters through that relationship, if you like, or is, is that too many stages well, they, they, beyond? they tried it with Victoria Beckham about three or four years ago. I don't know to what extent that worked. There is an example of how the market can be changed quite radically through rebranding, which is the, in the realm of prints. About four or five years ago, Philips stopped calling prints prints, and they called them editions. And this proved to be a complete masterstroke, because editions you associate often with luxury. And because of this, the numbers, the sales figures for their print sales, increased massively. Now, they're trying it with old master paintings, but the main way, of course, is you get rid of old. Who wants to be associated with anything old? Okay. Culturally, it's a catastrophe. So they call them either masters or classic pictures, which is, I think is a is very sensible way of moving forward. But it does need at so many different levels reinventing this market. But the other problem is that if you go into any old master gallery or you go to TFAF, the way that it's presented, and the pictures are on dark walls, the person you're talking to will be a middle-aged man wearing a tie, a middle-aged white man wearing a tie, and it's that monoculture everywhere. Uh, you won't see someone who's trying to sell these things, say, in a pair of good jeans or sneakers. They really need different sorts of people presenting these works. Then they stand a better chance of getting a different kind of public coming in. Scott, thank you so much for guiding us through this extraordinary territory. A pleasure. You can read Scott's articles on the Masters Market at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. Coming up, the controversial Ram Temple in India and an Honoré Daumier cartoon. That's after this week's news bulletin. 
Carl Andre, the American sculptor who helped define the minimalist movement, has died. He died in a hospice facility in Manhattan, and his death was confirmed by Paula Cooper Gallery, with which the artist had worked since 1964. He was 88 years old. His work often consisted of industrially fabricated forms made from simple raw materials, such as metal, granite, wood and brick, arranged in freestanding formulations. Since the mid-1980s, Andre's legacy as an artist has been complicated by accusations that he killed his wife, the artist. Anna Mendieta, who fell to her death from the window of their 34th floor apartment in Greenwich Village in New York in 1985. Andre denied the accusations, insisting that Mendieta's death was either an accident or a suicide. In 1988, he was tried and acquitted on a charge of second-degree murder. Subsequent exhibitions of his work have often been met by protesters who've criticised galleries and institutions for failing to acknowledge his involvement with Mendieta. An artist who was one of the re-performers participating in Marina Abramovich's 2010 retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, or MoMA, in New York, is suing the museum. John Bonafede claims MoMA is liable for seven incidents of sexual assault he allegedly experienced while performing there. According to his complaint, filed on Monday in New York State Supreme Court, the alleged incidents all took place while he was re-performing in Ponderabilia, a piece originally performed by Abramovich with her partner Ulai that involves a male and female performer standing nude on either side of a narrow doorway through which visitors are encouraged to pass. Bonafede says he was sexually assaulted seven times by five different visitors while performing the work. The lawsuit claims that female performers of the piece, as well as performers participating in other parts of the exhibition, were also victims of sexual assault and non-consensual sexual touching on a regular basis. As I record this, the museum has not commented on the case. Two of the UK's leading national museums have signed a loan agreement with Ghana to return gold regalia that was looted during military operations in the 19th century. The British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum have made the arrangements with the Mania Palace Museum in Kumasi, the capital of what was then the Ashanti Empire. Most of the 32 pieces will be seen in Ghana for the first time in 150 years. The deal was arranged when the current Ashantene or King Osei Tutu II visited London in May last year and met the director of the V&A, Tristram Hunt, and the then director of the British Museum, Hartwig Fisher. The two UK museums are legally unable to deaccession, so the objects are being returned as long-term loans, initially for three years. To read these stories and much more, visit the website or the app. Now, in India, the Hindu nationalist Prime Minister Narendra Modi has unveiled the Ram Mandir, a temple to the Hindu god Ram, built on the site of a 16th century mosque raised by an extremist Hindu mob in 1992. The temple, which remains unfinished, is at the core of a complex that will eventually reach 49 metres tall with five domes. At its centre is an idol of Ram as a child. And the temple has prompted several ongoing development projects across Ayodhya, which is being called the Indian equivalent of the Vatican City by some pro-governments supporters. Our deputy art market editor and regular reporter on matters relating to India, Kabir Jalla, is in Mumbai and I spoke to him about the history of the site, how the temple's unveiling might affect the forthcoming elections in India and about how it's affecting the Indian art world and particularly the art market. Kabir, you're in Mumbai. Tell us what this unveiling of the Hindu temple is like in India? How much of a national event is it? How much is it dominating the news cycle, etc.? Ben, have you ever been to an Indian wedding before? (laughs) No, I have not. Have you heard of the term big fat Indian wedding? I have indeed. (laughs) This is a big fat Indian consecration. It is uh, nationwide. It is everywhere. The entire sort of event has been going on for about three weeks to a month um, in actuality. But Monday was the day in which the Prime Minister Narendra Modi officially inaugurated the temple by placing a statue of uh, the baby Ram called Ram Lala in the temple itself. I've seen the pictures and it seems to me that Modi is casting himself not just as a prime minister here. Obviously, this is a sort of religious institution and he comes across much more like he's a priest than prime minister. Is that a deliberate tactic? Absolutely. I mean, many people have commented that at the centre of this entire ordeal is not the Lord Ram who the temple is for, but it is for Modi. Ayodhya, the town in which this is taking place, is in the state of Uttar Pradesh, or UP, which is the most populous state in India. It has a population um, more than Brazil. And it is also the heartland of India, and it really matters to politics. People say, you win UP, you win the country. And we are right at the beginning of a re-election campaign by Modi. This is a very, very tactical decision to paint himself 
in this manner. This is also incredibly congruous with what Modi's entire campaign for the last 10 years essentially has been placing himself both as a strong man, but also as a religious figure, the head of a movement called Hindutva or Hindu nationalist ideology that is going to reclaim India and make it powerful again. Right. I mean, it's, it's really interesting how central to Modi's entire project, if you like, this temple is, isn't it? Because in, in a way, it's the foundation stone of that project. Because is it right that in 1992, when that mosque on the site was destroyed, at that point, the BJP was not a significant force in politics. And it's from there that in a way they built their support and, and eventually their, their incredible popularity. That's absolutely correct, Ben. They were a presence in politics prior to that, but this is really one of those key moments in which they gain huge traction. The history of Ayodhya stems back hundreds and hundreds of years. The conflict itself sort of dates from about 1949, we can place it, when a group of Hindu nationalists placed an idol inside the mosque, an um, idol of the Lord Ram, and the government decided to seal the mosque because it was attracting so much conflict. Then for about 30 or 40 years, it was sealed and it was a site of incredible contention until one day in 1992 where there was a rally. Members of the RSS, which is um, a huge paramilitary organisation in India, very much linked to the BJP, Modi's party. And Modi himself was a member of the RSS very early on in his political career. That's where he sort of got his first steps in. They basically gave very, very fiery speeches that encouraged a mob of Hindu nationalists and extremists to tear down the temple first with hammers and bats, and then eventually with machinery. And that then sparked deadly riots across India, intercommunal riots that killed around 2,000 people, predominantly Muslims, one of India's bloodiest chapters of sectarian conflict in its modern history. Now, tell us why they did that, because is it right that they believe that there was a Hindu temple on that site initially, and the mosque was built over it? And is there any archaeological evidence to support that fact? Yes. So at the centre of this conflict, there is a belief that the mosque, which was built in the 16th century, was built atop a temple which was forcibly demolished to make way for this mosque. This fits into a much wider narrative in which Hindu nationalists believe that the medieval period of India is one of great humiliation in which Mughal invaders who are Muslims came and sort of destroyed a pure Hindu culture. So therefore, there have been claims for at least 200 years that the, the rule of Barbara, which is where the mosque named Babri Masjid gets its name from, came and basically conquered the land. And this is a very, very holy site. And of course, the fact that there was a temple there is all the more important because this town, Ayodhya, is one of the holiest sites in Hinduism. Because according to this ancient text of Ramayana, this is where the Lord Ram is born. Now, we'll get onto the fact that this is an ancient religious text in a second because it is being used as historical fact. But as a result, this has been a very, very contentious site. In 2003, there was an archaeological study done that basically found evidence of a structure beneath the mosque that the Archaeological Survey of India says is suggestive of some temple structures. This has been roundly criticised and pushed back by other leading archaeologists, including people that have written for the Art newspaper and we've even had on the podcast before. So there's no conclusive evidence at all. And actually, the Supreme Court verdict in 2019 that basically decided that there could be a temple built upon this even found that there wasn't any conclusive evidence that there was a Hindu temple that had been forcibly removed to make way for a mosque. Right. And, and it's really crucial that you mention the Ramayana, because what you're saying effectively is that what Modi was doing when he was unveiling the temple is not just revealing a building, but kind of enshrining a myth effectively. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. I want to bring up a part of Modi's speech that he gave on a Monday during the inauguration, in which he says, the legal battle over the existence of Lord Ram went on for decades. Ram's existence was questioned. And I don't think that there is any doubt that the Prime Minister of India is now treating a religious text as fact and was upset or, you know, is professing that he was upset by the fact that that text was being challenged as fact. I would like to remind all listeners that India is a secular state, the Republic, 
we have a constitution. The preamble very, very clearly states that we are a secular nation. It is part of the founding principles of this country. And I want to bring up another part of Modi's speech now, actually, because what happens in Ayodhya is not just about Ayodhya. It is about the entire idea of India. And as Modi has said to us, January 22nd, 2024 is not merely a date that marks the advent of a new era. This is the temple of national consciousness in the form of Ram. Ram is the faith of India. Ram is the foundation of India. Ram is the idea of India. Ram is the law of India. I don't have to translate for you what that means. That is so clear in place that we have moved from a secular republic and idea and law into one of a Hindu majoritarian country that is going to rule like that. Right. I mean, you mentioned the election a bit earlier. Is there any sense in which that constitution itself will be challenged? Because this is third term for Modi that he's aiming for. And it's, you know, by all accounts, it seems like he's going to get. So is that secular constitution under threat? Insofar as that the, the constitution has been rewritten, no. But of course, Modi's entire administration has been marked by an erosion of several key tenets of a democracy, of a healthy democracy. He has loaded the court, he has eroded civil liberties, he has completely undermined journalism, he has punished and policed and even locked away his political opponents. So it is not at all out of reach that Modi could, you know, legally try and undermine India as a secular state. And quite frankly, if you're listening to that speech, what do you think? Absolutely. I wanted to explore just how widely this idea of, in a way, uh, challenging India's past is sort of rippling through the culture. Because Modi and his supporters quite openly say that they are rewriting history, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. It's been a key push of the BJP that they are going to sort of return India to a sense of greatness that it has not been in since the Mughals have invaded and then afterwards the British colonised. And there is this idea of a pure India, a pure India that was built by Hindus and that has been lost and that can be reclaimed. Obviously, you can trace these parallels to a number of other majoritarian populist leaders over the last 10 years who have also been promising returns to a sense of greatness. The interesting thing with Modi is that his regime, they gain a lot of strength through archaeology and archaeological discourse because they use that, they wield that as also a tool to basically prove that there's a link back thousands of years to a culture that once existed. Obviously, you're then treating scripts and texts and often fictional texts from those times as fact because that's all you have but it doesn't matter because it proves that you have a link to a glorified past. And one of the things that I think is really telling in this, and I think will surprise listeners who don't know this already, is that within the the state, that very popular state of Pradesh that we're talking about, is of course the Taj Mahal. And even the Taj Mahal's status as a kind of icon of India is under threat, right? Absolutely. There have been complaints from the Taj Mahal to UNESCO about its upkeep, which the government is obviously meant to take care of because the Taj Mahal is itself a Mughal monument. And Modi wants to change the idea of India's most iconic piece of architecture from something that was built by Muslims into ideally something that was built by Hindus, possibly the Ram Mandir. Well, let's talk about how this affects the art world, because it does it affect the art world, because you've been at Mumbai Gallery Weekend recently, the India Art Fair is next week. To what extent is the art world sort of continuing as normal? To what extent is it affected by this culture that is growing and swelling around it? I think to some extent it's difficult to answer that. It's difficult to ever answer questions of self-censorship because they happen before the fact. I obviously want to qualify that I've only been reporting on the Indian art world for about five years, so I can't categorically say what it was like before, but speaking to a lot of gallerists and artists, they do tell me that this is the worst it's been in terms of being able to say what you want in public spaces. Of course, there are ways to still get around it and to be clever, and often the best art isn't the one that is sloganeering something. It does help to an extent that India most of the good art that happens is in commercial galleries because state institutions, even if they weren't doggedly watched by far-right political leader, they are very, very underfunded. So it's very rare that cutting-edge stuff happens in them, typically in the commercial galleries where you do have more agency. Of course, even then, you do have to play it quite safe. 
But speaking to people that I know who are gallerists and artists, I can guarantee you that Monday was a very dark day for those who believe in a secular and liberal India. You talked about the kind of gallery scene there. There's an interesting sort of competition, if you like, between Mumbai and Delhi, because Delhi's obviously the site for the India Art Fair, which is happening next week. But Mumbai's gallery scene is really growing. And, and it sounds like the Mumbai Gallery Weekend was quite thriving when you went there last week. Absolutely. Yeah. So for about the past decade or even 15 years, Mumbai and Delhi have sort of been in this, shall we say, neck and neck situation where Mumbai is the financial capital of India. I wouldn't say it necessarily has more money. People say that there is actually more money in Delhi because that's where the politics is. But this is where all the banks are, at least. And Mumbai has always had more galleries, but it's never been like a complete uh, one or the other. Delhi, until very recently, had South Asia's only art fair of note, the India Art Fair. Then last year, Art Mumbai opened up. Delhi, for a while, had South Asia's largest collector, Kiran Nada, who was buying up art at a very rapid pace. So there did seem to be some pull away. But yes, in the last couple of years, something really interesting has happened in which Indian galleries, which typically only operate in one city, either Mumbai, Delhi, very rarely in Calcutta or Bangalore, have been opening up second locations in Mumbai. This first happened with Experimenta, which is uh, the leading gallery in Calcutta. Their program is very well known across South Asia and the world as well. In fact, they won the Freeze Stand Award just last year at the Freeze London. They opened up an outpost in Mumbai and then Nature Mort, which is one of the two largest contemporary art galleries in Delhi, has also opened up a Mumbai outpost as of uh, this month. So there does seem to be a sort of critical mass that is forming around the Mumbai art scene. And this all is in the context of India's own art market, doing tremendously well within the context of India. That's right. There's been all sorts of auction records tumbling left, right and centre. Yeah, absolutely. Every six months, the record breaks once again. At the moment, it's been held by Amrita Shagil's The Storyteller, which I think made 7.6 million at auction. It typically is either an Amrita Shagil, who was Hungarian Indian modernist painter, or one of the Bombay Vigressors, which are a sort of abstractionist group from the 50s and 60s. And it goes between them, typically. The turnover of the Indian art market of the financial year 23 got to 144 million, which is the highest ever. And that was a 9% increase on last year, which is again a record year. So the market is increasing. And this is in a wider context of uh, India's own economic growth, which is going gangbusters, as Peter Nike of Nature Mort described it to me last week. <laughs> and it is true. Um, the UN's latest report has projected that India is going to be the fastest growing economy of this year. I think growth is around 6.2%, which is you know, higher than they said any other economy. And this is also important because key other global markets, those are the EU, UK, China, are seeing slowdowns and stagnation for a variety of reasons. And so people are looking to India as the next place to invest and take notice of. And that is only going to have a trickle down effect on the art market. There are a couple of questions that come to me from hearing you say that. And one is, you've mentioned the kind of modernist artists doing well. At the start of this century, there was a big groundswell of international interest in contemporary art from India. There were big group shows. Lots of those artists began showing quite internationally and broadly. To what extent is the kind of interest in contemporary art sort of keeping parallel with that interest in modernism? And then also... Is it that healthy, really, that we're talking so much about contemporary galleries in terms of, you know, are there any institutions that are also doing compelling programming and sort of leading the discussion, if you like? Both great questions, Ben. So, yeah, to the first one, you're absolutely right. There has always been a sort of chasm between the moderns and the contemporary in India, and you're seeing it right now, even today. In fact, in the financial year of 23, contemporary art auctions actually fell by 9% even though the entire field rose, although I should say that contemporary art auctions across the world decreased. So you can sort of make parallels with other markets. That being said, yeah, India experienced a huge boom and bust in the early 2000s. And as a result, contemporary art really did take a big hit. And it's taken a while to get back up to scratch. I would say, speaking to gallerists, that primary work is selling really, really well. The gallerists have done a pretty good job in learning from the mistake of the last boom and bust, which is to really focus on domestic collectors, to not raise prices too quickly, and to, I guess, focus on programs rather than focus on the heat of the market. This is now changing a little bit. I do notice prices getting a little bit too high, and I wonder if 
we're due a slight correction like we're seeing across the world right now. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of this idea of, you know, contemporary commercial spaces being the kind of leaders of this interest in terms of Indian art, is that is that healthy? And are there museums? Well, I mean, that question is a difficult one because to be blunt, no, it isn't necessarily healthy, but also what other option have we really had until very recently? I report a lot on the art market and I do so with a healthy dose of scepticism, as most market <laughs> reporters do. But I do have to give it to Indian gallerists. They really have done so much legwork in terms of um, exhibiting Indian artists and like building up programs and, you know, doing the books and doing the catalogues and giving them the materials and every single thing that an institution could also be doing. I think a great example, actually, is Experimenter in Calcutta. Until recently, there really wasn't a very good Kunsthalle in Calcutta. One has opened up recently, we can talk about in a second. But this gallery essentially has been one of the only places to see good art in a huge, huge city of millions of people. So it's been doing a lot of work, you know, sometimes silently for the last decade or so. But yes, of course, that also does mean that the contemporary gallerists in India hold a great degree of power. The discourse is conducted within their spaces. Obviously, that also has to do with the fact that the national museums, you often can't say what you need to, especially not today. However, I mean, I was speaking about this with a friend and I pointed out to her that the same thing is kind of happening in the West now as well. When you see museum shows that are underwritten by galleries, you know, whether it's Gustin at Tate, underwritten by Hauser and Wirth, Sarah Lucas's show with Sadie, these trends are happening all across the globe. So perhaps the question should be, do gallerists in general have too much power? Well, Kabir, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Ben. You can read more on this story on the website or the app. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. The Stadel Museum in Frankfurt, Germany, this week opened Honoré Daumier, the Helwig Collection. It's an exhibition of more than 120 works by the French artist, selected from the vast and esteemed Helwig Collection, which is being donated to the museum on its 125th anniversary via its parent organisation, the Stadelscher Museumsverein. The donor behind the collection is Hans-Jürgen Helwig, and he's chosen to discuss Daumier's unpublished lithograph from 1867, Madame Demenage. You can find Find an image of the work on our Instagram and in the web story for this episode. Hans Jürgen, before we talk about the specific work that we're going to talk about, I'd like to establish Daumier's reputation. So Daumier was, until relatively recently, in Britain at least, predominantly known as a caricaturist, actually. But then we had a big exhibition at the Royal Academy about 10 years ago, which mm -hmm. very much made the case for him as a sort of rounded artist. So he was an artist who was a painter, an extraordinary draftsman, as well as a political caricaturist, right? Well, I'm very happy to hear what you just said. And you know why? Because I was the major lender to the exhibition at uh -huh. the Royal Academy. And I've been at the exhibition for several days. And I had uh, two visits of the curators uh, from the Royal Academy. They had retained a Daumier expert from the United States. She's also visited with me. I'm very, very happy to hear that um, this exhibition has carried out a kind of a breakthrough for Daumier's reputation in Great Britain. Of course, in his own lifetime, there were artists like Delacroix who were responding to him, and then later Manet, Degas and others. He was an artist artist, even though, you know, we're only now at this point really grappling with the breadth of his achievement. Yeah, I think there's only one explanation for it, maybe two. The first one is a simple one, namely differences in age. And the second one has to do with the areas in which these artists have been active. Delacroix was drawing and painting, the other ones as well. Daumier started his life as an artist with lithographs. Now, lithographs, that was a new technological method, well received, tremendously successful in the market, but it probably never achieved the same level of art recognition as the other sectors of creating art. That's fascinating. And that's why 
Gaumier was always suffering from the image of, well, this was um, a minor art. It was not really the full art. Now, the question is why people were thinking so, because it was on newspapers and because there were many copies made. If it's a painting, you have one version only. It's one piece, no more. So the singularity, that's strange enough. The singularity makes the value, yeah. the artificial value. The market value, I understand, but the artificial value, to base that on how many issues are running around, it's a little bit counter the spirit of art. And Domier was suffering under that. Now tell us, lithography is actually a really difficult art. I've seen doing printmaking and trying to get the lithography right. One of the great achievements, it seems to me, of Domier is the lightness of touch that he achieves with lithography, the extreme poetry, if you like, of his line. Mm -hmm. He's just such a master at lithography. Well, that's true. And that really is outstanding with him. Domier is a master in the creation of different shades between white and black. And in doing so, he has the ability to give a bidimensional drawing the impression of three dimensions. And that is fabulous. That is absolutely fabulous. And the other artists engaged in lithography simply were not good as Domier. The image that we're going to talk about now is a case in point because he manages to conjure up such a wealth of materials and action and this sort of amazing lightness of touch on the one hand and the heaviness at other. So it's, tell us about the image that we're looking at. When we're discussing this aspect, I think we ought to go back to his education as an artist. He was given some lessons in drawing by a friend of his father. But most of what he learned, he learned by himself, by making copies of paintings in the Louvre. And that's where he basically learned the proportions of a human body and how they vary depending on the angle from which you look at it. And if you go around a sculpture, then you can realize that the sculpture changes the impression it makes on the onlooker, depending on the angle. What's unique about Domier is he understood the proportions of the human body, in particular when the muscles are flexed, when the body is flexed and so on. And he was able to transfer the three-dimensional sculpture impression onto a bidimensional piece of paper. Now tell us what this image depicts. It's an extraordinary image. I start with the historic background. We are in the 1860s and Napoleon III, the nephew of Napoleon I, had given orders to have railroads constructed from various places in France to the German border in order to have a fast means of transportation for his military troops. And that was perceived by Daumier and others as a preparation of war. And Daumier criticized that decision by the emperor by creating this lithography. Now, when we look at the image, we find a locomotive under steam with a human skull and human bones on the front side of, of the locomotive. And the locomotive is being pushed forward like a horse by the Grim Reaper with his scythe. Now, the Grim Reaper with his scythe is an invention by a German artist, namely by Alfred Rethel. Alfred Rethel had created a full series with the title The Dance of the Dead. And the French newspapers in 1849 carried copies of the entire series by Alfred Rethel. So Alfred Rethel's series was imported into France. And Domier was highly impressed. And therefore, he borrowed this motif of the reaper with a scythe and put it to work in this image. It's a clear, it's a clear message. It's what we call in Germany the Vater Tod. It's the well, Zensenmann. This is a part of the German cultural memory, but it has also become part of the cultural memory in France. So the very symbol was imported from, from Germany into this French lithography. Now, when we look at the legend, the legend, uh, the first line says, Translation des cimetières, the transfer of the cemeteries. And the line thereafter says, Hurra les morts vont vite. Now, what does transfer of the cemeteries mean? It means that the male population of France 
will no longer die and be buried in their home country, France, but on the border to Germany. A soldier's cemetery will be their last place of rest. The next line, Hurra les morts vont vite. It's another German reference, isn't it? Right, right. The French translation of a recurring verse in a ballad by Gottfried August Bürger, entitled Leonore. That long, very long ballad with a, with a horrible story. That appeared in Germany and a translation was published in France in 1823. Now, what's the story of Leonore? Leonore has a fiancé called Willem. Willem is out in the east of Europe in the war. She's expecting him home. He doesn't come. One night, he does come on horseback. And he pulls her up on her horse. And off they ride into the night. And during that ride, he keeps repeating that sentence. Hurra, die Toten reiten schnell. Hooray, the dead ride fast. The ride ends in a cemetery besides an open grave. And at that point in time, the clothes of Willem drop down and Willem is a dead skeleton and falls into the open grave. So it's the symbol of the soldier that found his death somewhere in another country. He's belonged home by his fiance. He does return home, but only to be buried at home. This is all really significant, isn't it, in terms of what Daumier is therefore saying about Napoleon III's policies. Correct. Absolutely correct. The interesting thing then is this version was rejected. And another legend was tried out. Voyageur pour l'éternité, the travelers into eternity, was not accepted either. And then Madame de Ménage, which means death changes domicile or changes place. Yeah. Madame, because it's, it's in French, it's, it's female, it's, uh, it's feminine, it's la mort. Yeah. And the small photo next to it, it has that legend, Madame, c'est au Madame des Ménages, that was rejected as well. Why was it rejected as well? Because Madame des Ménages is really rather innocent. It's not aggressive. The image as such was so aggressive. The locomotive, under steam, pushed forward by a skeleton, by the reaper with a scythe, that was so strong that it was rejected. So it remained unpublished? It remained unpublished. Now, the image in my possession has the, has the full history of the legend, which makes it really unique. And I think it was previously in the Dreyfus, Roger Gaston Dreyfus collection. Uh, the small photo besides that's from the Metropolitan, but it only has the last version, Madame de Ménard which is, so to speak, the last essay to get the green light from censors. But the green light never came. It's really dramatic in that sense, because you actually are witnessing the editorial process, which is absorbing this image by Daumier and deciding ultimately that it was too dangerous to publish it. Correct. But it shows even more. When I grew up at school, I was given the impression that in the 19th century, the countries in Europe were living one beside the other. That is wrong. This is totally wrong. Think of how much France exported uh, political ideas into other countries. The French Revolution, 89, the Revolution of 1830, the Revolution of 1848. That has inspired all the other countries in Europe. Now, in the inverse direction, you have an import of ideas in art and poetry into France from other countries. Therefore, my conclusion is, and I, I could give you many more examples, my conclusion is the 19th century meant for Europe a single market in intellectual ideas and in art in an intensity that we have never again reached. The war of 1914-18 led to a collapse. There was no rebuilding of that internal market in these areas of human life until in the 50s when European integration began. And even with the progress made to date, we haven't reached the same intensity of a single market in intellectual matters of art as we had it in the 19th century in Europe. And that is also evidenced by this image. And that's why this image is so important. It shows the strength of the pure image, but 
the strength of that image is based on an import of the concept of the Reaper with the scythe from Germany. What an interesting interpretation. Hans Jürgen, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for the interview. Honoré Daumier, the Helwig Collection, is at the Städel Museum in Frankfurt, Germany, until the 12th of May. And that's it for this episode. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Alexander Morrison, and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Scott, Kabir, and Hans Jürgen. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. <laughs>